Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Giesecke, and this is The Limiting Factor. What was the purpose of Battery Day, and was the 4680 form factor the most important thing unveiled at Battery Day? This is the first video in a series that'll explore the implications of the teardown and specs of the 4680 battery cell I released in June and July. However, I'm starting with a video on the relevance of Battery Day and the 4680 for two reasons. First, this video will serve as a quick refresher on Battery Day, along with some updated information that wasn't included in my Lithium Mine to Battery Line series. Second, it seems there's a lot of hand-wringing about potential competitors to the 4680, which in my view isn't justified. We'll get into that at the end of the video. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors. As always, the links for support are in the description. First, what was the purpose of Battery Day? Tesla opened the Battery Day presentation with this slide showing CO2 emissions because Tesla's goal is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. They followed that slide up by saying that although Tesla has done a lot to transition the world to sustainable energy, they need to do a lot more. To put that in context, around the time of Battery Day, Tesla's battery cell consumption was at about 30 gigawatt hours per year, and at Battery Day they stated a goal of 3 terawatt hours per year by 2030. That's a 100x growth target in 10 years. With that in mind, they showed us this slide, which tells us exactly what the purpose of Battery Day was. In order to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy, EVs and energy storage have to be more affordable, and the factories that make them have to be built faster and with less investment. Let's analyze that statement, because it says a lot more than many people realize, and what it says matters. The statement is divided into two parts. The first part of the statement is that sustainable technology needs to be produced more cheaply, and the second is that factories need to be built quicker and with less investment. That is, we're looking at two separate and concurrent goals here that are of equal importance. Let's look at each. Starting with affordability, why is affordability so important and listed first? Because if sustainable technologies like EVs aren't affordable, the world can't transition to sustainable energy because from an economic standpoint, the products will be out of reach. So how is affordability achieved? What determines the cost of hardware-intensive products like EVs? For the purposes of this video, two factors, the cost of the materials that go into the vehicle and the cost and speed of the factories that make that vehicle. Let's look specifically at batteries. According to this slide by Roland Berger, the bill of materials that goes into a battery cell makes up 71% of the cost of production of a battery cell. Note this doesn't include any margin upon the sale of the battery cell itself, and also doesn't appear to include shipping, which, as per Sam Jaffe of eSource, can make up 10-15% to of the cost of a battery cell. Roland Berger's analysis also didn't appear to include tariffs, which costs Tesla about 12% for the cells Tesla imports from China and Japan into the U.S. The margin, shipping, and tariff costs could all be eliminated by vertical integration. If we look back to the bill of materials, vertical integration can occur for all the raw materials that go into the battery cell. Clearly, in the long term, a huge opportunity for affordability is vertical integration. That is, as Tesla's opening statement at Battery Day suggests, affordability is a distinct goal from scaling faster and cheaper. Building battery cell factories faster and cheaper doesn't reduce the raw material cost, which would remain 71% of the cell cost. Of course, the more affordable a product gets, the more demand it generates, which in turn eventually drives down the cost even further, which generates more demand. Tesla's leveraged that effect from the Roadster to the Model S to the Model 3, and their ultimate goal is to drive prices so low that the world can afford full electrification. That, in turn, is going to generate a hell of a lot of demand, and therefore demand for production capacity. This brings us to the second statement, which is the emphasis on scaling faster and with less investment. When you have products that are so affordable that most people in the world can afford them, and those products are desirable, you can expect planetary level demand, and that means a lot of factories need to be built quickly. We saw planetary level demand with cell phones, but cell phones only weigh about 180 grams, whereas a vehicle weighs about 1800 kilograms, which is 10,000 times more hardware. 
Yes, fewer vehicles are sold, but 20 times fewer, not 10,000 times fewer. And that means the EV ramp will require almost 500 times more material than cell phones. In order to meet the demand for such large and complex hardware, the factories that build that hardware need to be both faster to build per unit of capacity and lower cost per unit of capacity. I say per unit of capacity because it's not just about building factories faster and cheaper. It's about increasing the throughput of those factories by making the product itself easier to manufacture. Gigacastings are a perfect example of that and have eliminated two-thirds of the robots in Tesla's body shops. And this brings us back to the challenge that Tesla set for itself of scaling about 100x in 10 years in hardware-intensive businesses like vehicle manufacturing. There is no magic wand to make things. It takes industrial brute force. And when the thing that needs to be made is a replacement for the global fossil fuel economy, and that needs to be done in 10 to 20 years after spending 100 years building it, everything needs to be pushed to first principles extremes. And that's what Battery Day was all about. Affordable, sustainable energy products need to be produced at a global scale. But how to accomplish that? Tesla's looked at the conventional end-to-end -end flow sheet from lithium mine to battery line. They're reworking that flow sheet to maximize the speed and scalability by eliminating steps and increasing throughput. This is something that they're already doing with vehicles, but at the scale Tesla is targeting, it now makes sense to work upstream to component and raw material manufacturing. That is, the 4680 battery cell that's captured people's imaginations is just one aspect of a broader battery cell production system that's nested in a battery supply chain. The battery cells, of course, feed a pack production system, which is nested in a vehicle production system that includes improvements like gigacastings and the Cybertruck exoskeleton. However, we can use the 4680 cell form factor as a springboard to explore the manufacturing ecosystem that Tesla's building. Let's get into it. So why did Tesla choose a cylindrical 46 millimeter diameter cell? Starting with the cylindrical question, let's look at this one pager by Hannes Weinmann of RHC Plus Consulting. There are three form factor options when it comes to battery cells, pouch, prismatic, and cylindrical. Pouch cells inherently have a lower safety factor because there's no hard shell to contain thermal runaway events. Furthermore, pouch cells require more manufacturing steps than prismatic and cylindrical. With that in mind, prismatic and cylindrical appear to be the better options. So let's focus on those. When it comes to complexity of manufacturing, prismatic and cylindrical cells have a similar number of process steps. So, the choice between prismatic and cylindrical comes down to the considerations created by their shape and size. Those considerations are as follows. First, Tesla obviously increased the size of their battery cells when moving from the 2170 to the 4680 form factor. One of the main reasons for this was to reduce part count by five times, much like the move from the 1865 to the 2170 cut part count by about 33%. But if it were all about maximizing size, why didn't Tesla just go to an even larger cylindrical cell or prismatic cell? Because you can't just engineer to one design point. Size creates problems, which brings us to consideration number two. For a number of reasons, cylindrical cells tend to be much smaller than prismatic cells, which means less energy per cylindrical cell as compared to a prismatic cell. A battery cell that contains less energy means it's easier to control thermal runaway events. For an iron-based chemistry, prismatic works fine because iron-based chemistries are lower energy density and are less likely to go into thermal runaway. But Tesla's flagship 4680 battery chemistry will be nickel-based. Nickel-based chemistries are high energy and have a greater tendency to erupt into flames than iron chemistries. Third, a smaller cell means greater surface area per battery cell, which means that 4680 battery cells will be easier to keep at the correct temperature. That, in turn, will maximize charge and discharge performance as well as cycle life. So, overall, the 4680 form factor is a nice balance between creating a larger cell, yet keeping it small enough to be manageable in terms of safety and thermals. Fourth, cylindrical cells don't have square corners, which means they have consistent strength all the way around. The one area where there is weakness, the top and bottom, offers an opportunity. It's easier to fashion a cylindrical cell in a way so that if there's a thermal runaway event, the molten hot ejecta can be forced out of the cell directionally. For example, down and out of the vehicle. 
fifth, and this is speculation on my part, it might be more difficult to manufacture a tabless electrode on a prismatic cell than on a cylindrical cell. This is because the tabless electrode might be easier to form with a circular winding process. This is, as opposed to, a square winding that needs to be hot pressed. On that note, let's look at the importance of the tabless electrode. First, I've had a lot of suggestions on better naming for the tabless electrode, such as multi-tab, tabful, continuous tab, etc. But after a lot of thought, I think the tabless electrode is actually the best terminology. Here's why. First, the inventors named it the tabless electrode. It's their baby, and that's what they called it, so that's what I'm going to call it. Second, the inventors knew what they were talking about, and I think the tabless nomenclature is the most accurate description. A tab on a battery cell is something very specific. It's a piece of metal that's welded to the metal of the electrodes that carry the electrical current from the electrodes to the cell cap. What we see here with the tabless electrode is simply a series of cuts in the electrode. Those cuts temporarily look like flags after being lasered into the electrode, but ultimately are folded and compacted into a scale-like sheet of metal. That is, the flags aren't a welded tab, and they don't carry current from the electrode to the cell cap. They are the electrode. Instead, the current is carried from the exposed metal of the tabless electrode to the cell can by these hubcap-looking devices, which take the place of welded tabs. These hubcap-looking devices are referred to internally at Tesla as current collectors. So, to reinforce, the tabless electrode is exactly that. It's an electrode without welded tabs. The function that the tabs served is replaced by the current collector. What's the importance of the tabless electrode? It's twofold. First, it eliminates the manufacturing step of welding tabs to the electrodes in the cell cap. Welding the tab to the current collector is a delicate operation because they're super thin and flimsy. Meanwhile, welding the tab to the cell cap before closing the cell at a rate of millions per day would obviously be awkward as well. With the tabless electrode, there's no awkwardness. A sturdy current collector is rapidly laser welded to the chunk of metal exposed by the tabless electrode. Then, the jelly roll is stuffed into the cell can and it's crimped shut to complete the circuits from the tabless electrodes to the current collectors to the cell can. Second, the tabless electrode not only accelerates production speeds, it should also allow for better thermal management. This is because the tabless electrode shortens the electrical path through the cell, exposes more of the thermally conductive electrode foil for cooling pathways, and reduces current deviation throughout the electrode sheet, which can cause electrochemical hotspots. That improved thermal management is what allowed the 4680 to balloon by about five times the volume and weight while still maintaining good charge characteristics. With that said, were there other potential options than the tabless electrode to reduce heat generation and increase cooling? As per CleanerWatt's release of rumors about Panasonic's 4680, yes, Tesla could have done a multi-tap design with the 4680, but it would have been slower to manufacture. Panasonic's cell is rumored to have not just one tab, but five. Five tricky tabs to weld instead of just one. Additionally, will Panasonic's rumored multi-tab design have thermal characteristics that are as good as Tesla's tabless design in terms of heat generation, cooling, and current deviation? My guess is no, because although the 4680 would have five times the tab that a 2170 cell does, the 4680 would have five times the volume. That could provide good enough performance, but there is information out there suggesting that a tabless design would outperform a multi-tab design. This paper from Shun Li et al. showed how a 2170 cell with a single tab performs compared to a 2170 tabless design with what they called a comprehensive 3D electrothermal cylindrical cell model with high accuracy. They refer to the tabless design as an all-tab design because it used 22 tabs to approximate the effect of a tabless design. The all-tab design performed exactly the same as a cell with perfect theoretical thermal performance. This is as compared to the single-tab variants which had thermal fluctuations throughout the cells and were on average 0.2 to 0.3 Celsius hotter. Even the three-tab design and the small 2170 form factor performed worse than the all-tab design. 0.2 to 0.3 Celsius may not seem like much, but this is only after one minute at a 1C discharge rate, which means there's 59 minutes left to go before the cell is discharged. Plus, even slight thermal variations would have an impact on performance over the course of hundreds of cycles and many years. 
With all that said, to answer the question of whether a 4680 with five tabs performs just as well as a 4680 with a tabless design would require models of those cells or real-world testing. Regardless, the point here is that, as I mentioned in my lithium mine to battery line final video, all 4680 battery cells won't be created equal because the 4680 is a form factor and the guts of each cell will be different. My opinion is that the 4680 designed by Tesla will, when mastered, have the highest performance. Let's move on to why Tesla chose a 46 mm diameter cell, given that they could have made the cell as wide as a cheese wheel. As this graph shows, the 46 mm diameter was chosen because it offered a good balance of performance and cost. Tesla shows about a 7% range increase and an 18% cost savings from the larger form factor. But is 46 mm somehow a magic number? In my view, no. The choice of 46 mm may have been somewhat arbitrary. The reason I say that is because Tesla could have chosen, for example, 46.2 mm or 47.4 mm, and it would have made a little difference to cost, range, and charging speed. Let's do a quick recap. Tesla chose the 4680 form factor with tabless electrode to increase the throughput of their battery cell lines by reducing part count at both the cell and pack level. At the same time, they were able to maximize safety for a high nickel chemistry, maximize charge and discharge rates, and maximize thermal management. That is, it was a case of starting with a clean sheet, and making first principles-based design choices to develop a cell specifically for vehicles and energy storage. This is as opposed to the 1865 and 2170 formats currently used by Tesla that weren't designed from the ground up for vehicles and energy storage and trace their lineage back to laptops. So, although the larger size of the 4680 accelerates manufacturing, it was just one of half a dozen variables Tesla considered. With the 4680 cell analysis out of the way, we can finally get to the broader 4680 manufacturing ecosystem, which is where most of the magic happens. As I touched on earlier, on-screen is a typical end-to-end -end production process for a battery pack that would go into an EV, roughly 30 steps from mine to pack. This is compared to Tesla's process, which is roughly 22 steps. Let's start with the battery cell factory. The first step in making a battery cell is coating the copper and aluminum electrode foils with active material to form the cathode and anode electrodes. A typical wet process requires massive drying lines and a recovery system for the highly toxic solvent. Tesla's dry process eliminates 90% of the space and energy required because no drying lines are required and therefore also no solvent recovery. That makes it cheaper and faster for Tesla to scale. Furthermore, the line speed is also expected to be seven times that of a typical wet process. As I said earlier, it's not just about making cheaper factories that are easier to build. It's also about increasing throughput. A dry process will be a big contributor to that 7x speed increase. On that note, it's worth emphasizing that the 7x line output will be achieved by a number of innovations working together. For example, although Tesla's 4680 format has roughly five times the energy of a 2170 battery cell, the line output is seven times the output of a typical battery cell line. That is, the line speed increased beyond what we'd expect if the form factor was limiting line speed. Tesla not only looked at form factor, they looked at the battery line end to end and innovated at each step. If they hadn't, solving one bottleneck would have just shifted the bottleneck to the next manufacturing station down the line. So every step of the manufacturing process had to be reworked from the ground up. Let's look at two more innovations to drive the point home. After the battery cell is assembled, the next large bottleneck is formation and aging. Formation is where millions of battery cells are charged to, for lack of a better term, ripen them. Those millions upon millions of battery cells typically have to be stored, monitored, and temperature controlled for weeks. Tesla expects to reduce the investment and footprint for formation by about 86 and 75 percent respectively. They've done this by developing their own in-house electronics to reduce hardware costs, and presumably by using big data to accelerate the ripening process and reduce the amount of floor space required. And, of course, at the end of the battery line, Tesla's developed a structural battery pack. The structural battery pack will accelerate pack production because it will require five times fewer cells because the 4680 cells contain five times more energy. 
Plus, the battery pack doesn't require as much packaging in the form of modules, doesn't require steel beams, has a current collector for the cells that's easier to weld, and uses far fewer bolts and fasteners because it instead uses epoxy to bond the pack together. So, overall, the structural battery pack will come together much more rapidly and increase the throughput of pack assembly. I could keep going here with the cathode production factory, the lithium hydroxide factory, and even the lithium mine, but the point is sufficiently made for this video already. The 4680 form factor is just that. There's nothing magic about that specific form factor. What matters is the production system from lithium mine to battery line. It's about starting with a blank sheet and applying first principles to every step of the production process. In summary, at Battery Day, Tesla unveiled a comprehensive plan to become the best battery manufacturer in the world, because Tesla's mission statement is to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. That mission statement necessitates building the best manufacturing machine that Tesla can. And when Tesla looked at the battery manufacturing process, they saw opportunities to make it better, faster, and cheaper. But what about the quote-unquote competitors? The most common battery pack technologies I'm asked to compare the 4680 structural pack to are the BYD Blade battery that was unveiled last year and the recently unveiled CATL Qi Lean battery. All three are in their infancy as technology platforms, and all three have made big claims that they have yet to fully deliver on. So, at this point, a comparison is tricky. However, I think it is worth noting that the BYD Blade and Qi Lean packs will most likely come out of the gates swinging, with much higher production rates than the Tesla 4680 structural pack. This is because BYD and CATL have taken fewer risks with the cell manufacturing process itself. They're both still using a wet process. If Tesla had stuck with a wet process, the 4680 production system would already be on solid footing. But, in my view, a wet process is a handicap in the long term, and all battery manufacturers will eventually move to some type of solvent-free or reduced solvent process. If Tesla cracks their dry process, which I view as potentially the best solvent-free process, it sets them up well, potentially for decades. But, with that said, are BYD and CATL really Tesla's competition at this point? It would be silly to think so, given the evidence against it. Tesla is buying every battery cell they can from every manufacturer. Better technology from BYD and CATL means better and cheaper battery packs for Tesla vehicles, which is better for Tesla. A day will come when the dynamic changes, but that day could be 10 to 15 years away. Furthermore, because Tesla is building their strategy around the 4680, it will become increasingly important for Tesla to solve 4680 production challenges by next year. If things got really rocky with the 4680 ramp, those Chinese manufacturers could become increasingly critical for Tesla's battery supply. This reinforces the idea that, at this point, they're valuable partners for Tesla, not competition. Finally, the CATL and BYD battery packs were designed around their flagship LFP chemistries. This means those battery packs may be poorly suited to nickel chemistries. The reverse is also true. Tesla's 4680 battery cells are ideal for a high nickel chemistry, but may not be the optimum for an LFP chemistry. So, it's simply not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Overall, the alternative options that BYD and CATL are creating for battery packs make it easier for Tesla to both turn a profit and fulfill its mission statement. If Tesla also succeeds with the ramp of the 4680 production system and moving upstream into the battery supply chain, it will guarantee that Tesla can continue to ramp at 50% per year deeper into the future. That's good for the environment, it's good for investors, and for me, it's exciting to see a company make such bold moves with their engineering. And of course, we'll get deeper into that as we progress through this series on the 4680 teardown. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video or as a YouTube member. You can find the details in the description. A special thanks to Johan Yigsvid, Mark J. McCain, Jake Billick, Don Pettyjohn, Electric Goddess, Bubba Conway, Ralph Noletti, Joe Donahue, Casper K., and Rogelio Roger Figueroa for your generous support of the channel my YouTube members, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all your support, and thanks for tuning in.